Collins warned me, calm down, this is not a church service. You're going to a graduation ceremony. I can help you acknowledging God. Let us know that He is the source of that strength. They can do it, but guess what? I can too. Thank you very much. Next, we have a musical genius. She comes from uh, a musical family. Her ability is phenomenal. Years ago, I would come to Long West Preparatory Academy's graduation to see the graduates and, and to hear the late Rosalind Brunswick Governor. This young lady falls right in line. Her talent is extraordinary. If you will, put your hands together for Ms. Leo. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. To the faculty, the staff, Superintendent Roberts, and this graduating class, I just want to say to you, remember, only what you do, Christ will last. Whatever goals that you set, work, achieve those goals. Don't let anything or anyone deter you from doing the things that God has commissioned you to do. And always remember that He is your strength and the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. Always acknowledge God in all your ways and He will direct your path. And give Him praise no matter what. In spite of obstacles that may come, and I stand here to tell you they will come, but don't let them keep you from achieving your goals. Amen? Amen. This little worship just says, Lord, I will live.
production. Brother was educated in the public school system and attended Texas Southern University, the University of Houston, and the University of Phoenix. Frederick currently holds a master's degree in administrative law justice and a master's degree in business administration. While at TSU, Frederick was on the award winning Texas Southern University debate team under the tutelage of 60 year veteran Dr. Thomas F. Freeman. I'm privileged to say that Frederick was my colleague. We traveled on the debate team to Paris, France, Rome, Italy, Prague, Czechoslovakia, Johannesburg, South Africa. And we didn't travel because we deserved it. We traveled because we made up in our minds that education was important. And we knew that if we applied ourselves, opportunities would be there for us. Frederick has traveled as a speaker, he has encouraged audiences and organizations throughout the world. As a public relations strategist, Previn has planned and implemented and executed public relations campaigns. As a formal political staffer, Previn held key positions in communications and policy, eventually working his way up to chief of staff. Previn is the youth minister at Trinity Gardens Church of Christ under the ministry of Timothy Daniels. He's an author. He's written a book entitled Public Speaking the Freedom Way. He's an encourager, a motivator, a mind regulator. If you would, put your hands together for none other than Previn Jones. What a wonderful outpouring of excellence our eyes have witnessed and our ears have heard this afternoon. To Superintendent Roberts, to the Board of Trustees, to the faculty, staff, parents, friends, and even our enemies, I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know I don't have a lot of time but I do want to say this, I think it's proved an unusual punishment to come behind Dr. Seuss. You just shouldn't do that, just me. You just shouldn't do it. But, but I'll let God use me in my own way. Is that all right? With the brief moments that I have to share with you this afternoon, I want to speak to you from the subject, wake up call. Wake up call. When I was in college just a few years ago, I had a recurring dream that on the day I was to take my final examination for graduation, that I would oversleep and I would finally wake up and run to my class and the professor would tell me, son, you're too late, you missed the test. And as a result, I had to sit in the audience and watch my peers walk across the stage as they turned their tassel and receive their degrees. And from that dream, I developed kind of a paranoia about time, being where I needed to be, when I needed to be there. And so even today, when I travel, I'll set the clock on my smartphone, I'll set the clock in the hotel room, and I'll call down to the receptionist to get a wake-up call. And in spite of all of that, I'll still wake up before the alarm goes off, because when you're doing what you love to do, when you're walking in purpose, when you're walking in passion, you don't need an alarm clock to wake up. But that's just a fail state. They should have, at the appointed time, the person from the front has called and said, Mr. Jones, this is your wake-up call. And graduates this afternoon, this is your wake-up call. I'm a firm believer that when you have somewhere to be, you need to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. I don't care how deep and wonderful you are, United will not hold the airplane for you because you overslept. And I submit to you graduates this afternoon that there is a designated place for you to be at an appointed time. For some of you, that place may be the mayor's seat at City Hall. 
For some of you, that place may be the governor's mansion in Austin, Texas. For some of you, it may be the mahogany boardrooms on Wall Street. It may be the classroom. It may be Hollywood. It may be Broadway. But wherever it is, that is a designated place for you to be at an appointed time. As young adults, you must become very cognizant of time and keeping your appointments. You see, uh, the cycles of life operate in what we call seasons. You see, the farmer has given us a great example. The farmer will plant in the wintertime what he will plant in the springtime. And in the summertime, he will work to develop that which he planned in the wintertime and that which he planted in the springtime. And in the fall, the farmer will reap that which he planned, planted, and worked for. And so you must do the right thing at the right time. Because it's possible to do the right thing at the wrong time. You have an appointment with destiny. And now is the time for you to plan to plan and to work toward the destiny in the place that is designed specifically for you. Now is not a time for you to rest on your laurels and go to sleep because you have achieved a certain level of success. It's a dangerous time to be asleep right now. And as I thought about how to dramatize this point because I want to drill it in your head, my mind took me back in time to my fourth grade class when Miss Johnson read an arresting little story, story entitled Rip Van Winkle. Some of you may remember the story Rip Van Winkle, but I'm going to give you for the sake of time a condensed short interpretation of that story. Rip Van Winkle lived uh, in one of the 13 colonies before the American Revolution, before the United States became the United States. And Rip Van Winkle was kind of a slacker. He avoided hard work, and oftentimes he would go off to the mountains to get away from a hard day's work. And one day, Rip being typical, Rip he escaped to the Catskill Mountains to avoid a hard day's work. So he took his wife on, took his old dog book with him, and he went up the mountain. And when he got up the mountain, he ran into a strange man who offered him a strange drink. And for some reason, Rip took the drink and he drank it. And after he drank the drink, Rip got very woozy and sleepy. So he told him, well, you stand right here and watch God. I'm going to take you a little nap. So Rip took him a nap and he slept, and he slept, and he slept. And finally Rip woke up. And he called for his old dog, Wolf, to no avail. Wolf was nowhere to be found. He noticed something that was strange. It didn't feel right. He grabbed his beard and his beard had grown several inches and it had gray to the point of he didn't recognize it anymore. And he said, well, it's time for me to go home now. So he grabbed his right and he noticed that his right one had rusted and worn. And so he knew that something was wrong, but he just couldn't put his feet on it. So he made his way down the mountain. And as he approached the town, he noticed that the town had nicely paved streets. But when he went up the mountain, the town had dirt roads. He noticed that he didn't recognize anyone in the town, and he thought he knew everyone in town. And finally, Rip made his way to town square. And he saw something that really pissed him off, that really ruffled his feathers. This was the last straw. He knew that something was different, but when he looked up and saw the picture of a man by the name of President George Washington in the place of King George III, he grabbed the pacifier and said, wait a minute, what is going on here? Who is President George Washington? And where is the picture of my beloved king? sense of bewilderment, he said, son, we are no longer subjects of the King of England. This is no longer a colony, but this is the state of New York in the newly independent United States of America. Sir, a revolution happened in this country 20 years ago, and by the way, we won. Rip Van Winkle discovered that he had been asleep for 20 years. Woe be unto you if you retreat to the proverbial mountains of rest and take a sleep just because you graduated from middle school. 
There is a revolution going on right now in this country, but this revolution that I speak of is not being fought with bullets and guns. But the revolution that I speak of is being fought with binary codes and smart devices with artificial intelligence. Through our human ingenuity and innovation, there's a revolution going on in commerce and international trade. We made the world community a local community. We erased national borders and we can now export people, services, and knowledge like no other time in history. What does this mean practically for you and I? The individual has been empowered to access global markets from the comfort of his or her own living room. The author E.L. James, who wrote The Fifty Shades of Grey, self-published the book initially because the big publishing houses didn't want to give her a country. And she took it to the global market through the web platforms that allows us to go beyond traditional means of doing business. And as a result, several thousand copies sold in the blogosphere went crazy. And then the big publishing houses came knocking on her door and signed her. Now, almost a hundred million books later, the author has achieved tremendous success. That's the kind of world that we live in today through our human ingenuity and innovation. There's a revolution going on in communications. Mark Zuckerberg said that he wanted to make the world more open and connected and has almost connected over a billion people on Facebook. And now through social media platforms and the various technologies that's available to us, we can now communicate in real time and see the person that we're talking to. See, when I grew, grew up, we had two phones in the house, one in the front room and one in the back room. And if you didn't have a, a phone in your room, you had to get a 50-foot car. You had to drag the phone to your room. And I would drag the phone to my room, get under the covers, and talk on the phone with my boo. And then my mama would get on the phone, walk out the phone for the fast girls to go to bed. She picked up the phone in another room, but now you guys got smartphones, you can Skype and Tango and see the person you're talking to in real time. That's the kind of world that we live in today. Through our human ingenuity and innovation, we have made great strides in the area of medicine and science. We have been able to map and sequence the entire genetic molecular structure of the human body and what the scientists call the human genome project. So now doctors and scientists can tell which diseases you are predisposed to from birth and come up with a prevention plan to prevent you from even getting the disease. We now have pacemakers that's connected to smart devices and web service. So I was reading uh, in one journal, a hospital was able to call a man two days before he was getting ready to have a heart attack to tell him to get to the hospital. That's the kind of world that we live in today. What does all this mean? What does this mean for you and I? Number one, what are the takeaways? Number one, the fundamental structure of young people of our economy has forever changed. We have shifted from an industrial-based economy to what Dr. Peter Drucker called a knowledge-based economy. Number two, the employment landscape has forever been altered. Number three, and most important, this will create tremendous opportunities in the marketplace to those who are prepared to compete on a global scale. No longer are you just competing with students in Houston, Texas, or Los Angeles, or New York. You are competing with students in Bangladesh, in Beijing, in Johannesburg, all over the world, because the world has now become an open place. And you must be prepared, you must be prepared to compete in this open place. I'll leave you with this. In the midst of all of this change, in the midst of all of the things that are going on in a world where the only thing that is constant is change, there is one thing that you need to know that you know that you know. And that is you need to know who you are. In a changing world, you must know who you are. You must define yourself to the world. You must tell the world who you are because if you don't define yourself, 
others will define you. And, and the human frailty is this. We have a tendency to define people by their mistakes. We have a tendency to define people from their shortcomings, by their shortcomings. This is why you must take the initiative to define yourself now. And last but not least, when you know who you are, you know where you belong. No one has to tell the fish that he belongs in water. And by the way, no one has to teach the fish how to fish. As long as the fish is in the environment that God created it to live in, it can function at its highest level. No one has to tell the cheetah how to run, because as long as the cheetah is on land, that cheetah can function at its highest level. A cheetah can go from zero to 60 in five seconds and can run up to 75 to 80 miles an hour as long as it's it is in the environment that God created it to function in. No one has to tell the eagle to take it to the air. Because as long as the eagle is in the environment that God created it to function in, it will fly and soar. And I say to you that right now, school is the environment that you belong in. Won't be unto you if you get to high school and go to sleep and drop out in the ninth or 10th or 11th grade because you say, I'm not feeling this school thing no more. And you drop out and go to sleep. That would be like taking a fish out of water and putting it on land. Or taking an eagle out of the air and putting it in water. It's the wrong environment. It cannot function. It cannot survive. School is the place where you will learn what gifts and talents you have which will direct you into the ultimate environment that God created for you. So I say this to you, that you need to, whether you're swimming, running, or flying, you need to keep moving in the direction of the place that God has designed for you because you have an appointment with destiny. This is your wake-up call. You don't have to remember my name. You don't have to remember my face. Just like that person on the other end of the line that calls you when you're at a hotel and says that this is your wake-up call. I just want you to remember the message this afternoon that today is your wake-up call. May God bless you. May God continue to keep you and make you have great success to be the best you that you can be.